Um, awesome. Well, thank you to everyone for coming. And uh, we're going to take two breaks in here, basically, so that the cameras can recharge and all that other stuff. Um, but if anyone has questions as we go along, like just because we're filming, don't feel like you can't ask questions or talk about things. I might say that there's a slide for that coming up or something, but also it helps me to know what kind of information people need. So um, there's a little bit of a spread here in terms of skill level. So I think some people are probably more advanced users and some people are just like maybe getting started um, on Instagram. You guys are, maybe aren't on it yet, but hopefully you will be after Personal, this. Yeah. Personally, but not professionally. Okay, that's fine. Awesome, so we'll get started. <coughs> so when a lot of companies or people that I work with uh, aren't on social media yet or aren't um, very active, they ask me if it's too late and I say no, of course not. Like you can get started anytime. Uh, but at the same time, it is almost too late. So um, it's, it used to be enough to just be on social media uh, because not everyone was there and if you were there and you were posting a couple times a week then you were probably doing just fine but now because everyone is on there there's a higher level of competition and so it's not enough to just be online you actually have to start to get good at it and so that's one of the things that we want to do with this workshop today um, with that in mind all companies now to an extent are media companies so the industry standards for businesses that really want to be aggressively growing is that you should be putting out between 50 and 75 pieces of content per week. So that's a lot. That's a lot of posts on Facebook, Instagram, Instagram stories, <laughs> Facebook stories. Um, and so in terms of coming up with all of that content and creating all of that material, that's a big workload. And companies are having to make adjustments in order to create all of that material. Um, it's also becoming less possible to outsource it. Um, I even, a lot of real estate agents tend to uh, have packages where people are putting blogs out for them about market information and real estate numbers and things like that. It's less and less impactful because social media should really be about building relationships for your business. And so if you're outsourcing the whole thing and automating it, it loses that personal touch and it stops being effective and competitive for your business. Um, Throughout the program, I will give you some tips on if you are working with a professional on how to do that so that you get support on it without outsourcing it and losing touch with what's happening. Um, so the other thing about social media now is that it's becoming so powerful and that need, that constant need for content is creating a situation where the tail wags the dog. So when companies used to do their marketing plans, they would do their marketing plan and then social media was used as a place to dump stuff and inform people 50% off, I have two appointments left on Thursday. It was just a place to notify people of things. But because of that need for content and the businesses know they have to be putting that out, what's happening is you have to start planning your uh, marketing from your social media backwards. So if you know you have to put between 50 and 75 pieces of content out a week, what are you gonna be doing in your business? How do you run your business? How do you make changes so that you can fulfill that need? And not only put that kind of content out, but make it interesting and engaging. Um, so the four ways that we're kind of seeing social media change marketing is that concept of planning from social media backwards. Also, um, your print costs are gonna to wanna to be reallocated to something called the cost of creative. So. Again, five, 10 years ago, one of the only marketing avenues for small business was newspaper print, which was still very expensive, hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars to get a significant ad. Social media is free, which is seductive to people, and we think that's great. Um, and initially, again, because you're only posting a couple times a week, that was fine. But because we're having to put so much content out now, and that content's so competitive, it's creating a cost of creative. So all of a sudden, small businesses are having to invest in photo shoots, which they would never have done before, or they have to make video and have like video content going out, which is another thing that they would never have done five to 10 years ago. So we're just seeing uh, the areas on where you make investments and where you spend on your marketing is shifting and changing. 
The third change is that you're going to actually have to create workflows around creating content. So if anybody here has staff or works in an office where you have lots of people working with you, eventually you're going to have to get to a place where maybe you have guidelines or other people supporting you in creating content and deciding who takes over the account when you're away and what kind of posts go up. Um, and so definitely throughout this program, I'll give you guys some tips on how you can create better workflows and get your teams to help you as well. Um, and finally, this uh, last point here about consciously creating your brand equity. So because uh, small businesses can be online and be in contact with their clients 24 seven, um, you have much more influence over creating your brand. And whenever I say brand, really what I'm saying is reputation. Uh, so you can start to influence your reputation. And there's something developing here for small business called brand equity. So for example, if I was going to, I have a podcast series and I'm looking to have a guest on, I'm going to pick as my guests people who have active and engaged social media, right? Or people who have big client bases or are influencers. So the activities that you're doing on social media are increasing your brand equity, which is measurable in how many people are liking and following and talking to you online. Um, really quickly, thinking about social media, it's an alternative to the newspaper. A lot of us get something delivered to our front door and it goes right in the garbage can because it's filled with stories about people we don't know or businesses that we don't care about. Every time you like a page or you start to comment on people's content, you're telling the algorithms that you want that content in your personal newspaper. So when you log in in the morning in that home feed, the content that you see there, the algorithms are guessing what you like based on your activities. So it's something to keep in mind that whenever you like or engage with something, you're giving permission to see more and more of that content. And you wanna use that uh, concept as well for your clients and that whenever they're liking and commenting on your material, they're telling the algorithms that they wanna see more of your content which is really important. Um, oh, don't be the classified section of the newspaper. Because your social media is, is a newspaper, a lot of small business owners get caught up in this idea of treating it like the classifieds and just talking about sales and, and things that they have uh, on offer. And you really wanna be creating a story. So throughout this workshop, I'm gonna to try to give you guys as many suggestions as possible for getting your business on the home page, the food section, the lifestyle section, so that your social media is more engaging. And just as a final thought on the difference between Facebook and Instagram. So Facebook is more like a newspaper and Instagram's more of a magazine. So there's a higher uh, quality expected on the photography and the quality of content that's going out on Instagram. And so usually when I'm designing my, my social media, I kind of start from Instagram and then put things on Facebook. But I really design to create that aesthetic first that's happening on Instagram. So in this workshop, I'm gonna go through sort of three different sections. The first one's gonna be on content psychology and strategy so that you guys feel confident about what you're posting, that it's gonna grow your business and increase your personal profiles. Um, and then the second section is gonna be on proving your visuals, so making your photos look better and putting better quality content out. And then the third section is gonna talk about engagement and the activities you should be doing that will help you physically grow your presence online. There we go. If we can do a cut here if we need to. <laughs> Are there any questions so far? No? Okay, I'll just keep going. So this first section is content, psychology, and strategy. So when I'm working with my clients, I usually tell them not to build a business, but to build a brand. So again, brand kind of means reputation. Uh, branding goes hand in hand with social media if you are a small business owner because you have 24 hour access to your clients. So for real estate agents, that means that five to 10 years ago, you might have been highly dependent on your brokerage to do large scale marketing campaigns or to build name recognition that helped you. That's why people chose Remax or Century 21. Uh, with conditions the way that they are now, 
it's very possible for a real estate agent or spa or something to start their own business and to create their own identity and bring in their own clients independently. Um, and that's really throwing a monkey wrench into some business models like Remax and Century 21 that kind of based all of their value on the, on the brand that they could offer. Um, again, only previously only really big corporations could afford to be in front of their clients enough, like using TV and radio, but social media is making that access free, which is really liberating a lot of small business owners. Um, so what we want to use our social media for is to consciously craft our reputation or our brand. So you really want to sit down and think about what it is you want your business's brand to be and you're going to use your social media as a mouthpiece to train people to say those things about you and your company. Um, one more quick word about why branding is really important. Um, we're starting to see the rise of voice. So lots of millennials have a Google Home or an Alexa and you can run a little experiment at home where you ask your Google or your Alexa to add ketchup to your grocery list or if you have like Amazon orders running and you ask Alexa, put some ketchup on my, in my shopping cart. Alexa will automatically select Heinz's ketchup. And so what's happening if you want French's ketchup, you have to specifically ask for it. So Alexa, I'd like French's ketchup on my grocery list. So what's happening is as voice starts to develop, more and more the algorithms and the computers are going to be deciding for you or for clients what business they're going to go to and what they're going to be choosing. So if you ask your Alexa to book you a chiropractor appointment or a barbershop appointment, it's going to start selecting unless you train your clients to ask for you first. And so that's, it's very early right now, but you can see how in five to 10 years it's going to be really important that everyone has developed uh, their brand equity and train their clients to ask for them specifically. So a really good exercise that I share with all of my clients um, is to sit down and really think about what it is you want people to say about your brand. So envision that two people are chatting in a room, talking about your business behind your back, and, and maybe just think about what are all of the things that you would want them to say. Um, maybe about your level of service, about your aesthetic, what would you want them to say about your business's values. Uh, your price point, uh, what would you want them to say about your skill level or your staff. So as you sit down and do that brainstorming activity, just write as much down as you possibly can. And all of those things that you write down become social media posts. So for example, at Brand Ambition, if we want people to say that we're youthful and millennial and trendy, then we're going to do some social media posts that show people that we're millennials and we'll maybe make jokes about eating avocado toast. And um, if we're talking about uh, trends, we're, we want to keep using that word and telling people that we're sharing the latest trends and here's a really trendy project that we did. So we're actually training our clients to say the words about our brand that we want them to. So this is a really good exercise that I kind of recommend everybody spend time doing. And again, all of those little sketches that you come up with, find a way to turn those into social media posts. And you can usually get between 15 and 20 unique posts just out of that one exercise. And rather than just giving you posts, those are posts that actually support your brand. They, they influence your reputation and it's giving you a little bit of control over what's happening and what's being said about you online. Uh, this is an example really quickly of um, some brand visuals. So this is a quick social media kit that we made for a spa that was having a fall beauty event. And I, I put this up just to show people some consistency, how we use the same colors, uh, how there's the same visual cues. So we kept using the pumpkins from one post to another. Um, I don't know how many business owners have thrown an event or a sale or something and you make one post for it and then you kind of like reshare the same post and you worry like how many times can I post about this before I bore my clients. Um, so creating a suite like this uh, where the posts are different but still recognizable from one touch to the other um, is a really powerful activity. So you can see here um, how we've done that. 
The other really great thing about some of this content is that it was created evergreen. So evergreen means that it doesn't have any dates or times written on it. Um, and that is really useful because you could use it again. So she can use this suite again next year and people who wanted to go last year but maybe couldn't because of their son's hockey game or something like that um, will recognize it and be like, ooh, I wanted to go to that but I couldn't make it. Uh, so you get that recognition from one touch to the other. Uh, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about building trust and authority online. So building trust and authority is really important because we don't want to just create demand for our service, right? You don't want people to just want a haircut or want a fitness instructor. You want them to want you specifically. So in addition to our posts about crafting our brand, we also have to do some posts about making people believe that we're the best at what we do. Um, and I'll start off by kind of explaining this principle that we talk about in the office sometimes. It's called the vegan's dilemma. So uh, let's imagine that you are thinking about maybe becoming a vegan. So you go online to Google and you're kind of like looking up information about this. And what happens is you'll be able to find 5 million websites that tell you that you should be a vegan and you should only be eating plants and it's a beautiful lifestyle. And then you'll find 5 million websites that say like, girl, you should only be eating steaks and seeds, like live the paleo lifestyle, right? So um, what happens is consumers get very overwhelmed with the amount of information that's available to them and then there's so much that's contradictory uh, each other. So what happens is that people end up going on social media and subconsciously they're looking for someone to trust. So they're looking for someone to tell them what of all of that information is actually true and useful to them. So uh, at a subconscious level, most people are building an informal circle of advisors online and you guys want that person to be you. So if I'm thinking about purchasing a new house, you want to create a, um, a situation where I would rely on you for your information. Um, and if we all saw like perhaps like a nutritionist put a, a, a recipe for chicken and we tried it and it was fantastic and you know, we start following her and we see her trip to the beach and she's losing weight and all these things. And then if that person tells us that uh, she's exploring the vegan lifestyle, we'd all be much more open to that. So people will take information from their circle of advisors before they will from untrusted cold sources. Um, so that means that online building trust is an objective that we all want to be acting on and techniques for building trust uh, number one is to be transparent, right? Uh, show people your office, show them pictures of your studio, show them the back room uh, where shoes come in or new products are unpacked. Um, very important, showing images of yourself. Uh, so many people, because they're uncomfortable having their photo taken or they don't like being on video, they don't show a personality or a human on their social media and how can anyone fall in love with you, build a relationship with you if there's no pictures of you. And the hair salon industry is pretty bad for that because there is so much beautiful content that you can share with haircuts and colors that I think the stylists forget to come out from behind their business and have people fall in love with their personal story about why they started this business and why they love it and the freedom or creativity that it gives them. So. Definitely, uh, you want to have yourself on your social media. Uh, communicating your values, what's important to you. I've worked with lots of companies who say, ooh, we're a family-oriented business. But if you go on their social media, there's no pictures of families, there's no talking about family, there's nothing like that. So there's no way for their audience to pick up on that kind of messaging. So again, thinking about your values or that exercise where people write down, where you wrote down all the things you'd want people to say, if you want them to say that you're family oriented, put examples and posts about that out. If you're a real estate agent and you want people to say that you're a tough negotiator, then talk about deals where you got the best price and how you like to negotiate and your strategies for opening or, or anything like that is all different post ideas that you can use. Um, really important to post things that aren't about work. Like every time I do this workshop, there's usually a gentleman in the audience who says, 
you know, I'm trying to make money and grow a business on social media. I don't understand why I'm sharing pictures of my salad or the latest pair of shoes that I bought. And the reason that you would do that is because you wouldn't go to a dinner party and just be like, I'm a real estate agent, buy a house for me, and, or I'm a hairstylist, you need to book an appointment and just keep talking about their business. Usually when you're in a social situation, you fumble around with other people trying to find something that you have in common with each other, right? And somebody, it's all awkward, and somebody says, oh, I take my dog to this dog park, and then somebody will go, oh, I go to that dog park. And then you start talking about it, and that's like the little seed of a friendship that develops. So if you're never putting any material out to show people what you have in common, you're not humanizing your business in a way that somebody else could be, and they'll scoop up your clients because they're going to develop relationships with them. So really important to share that outside of work content. Um, showing people what you have in common. So. Again, now that we're building trust with people, they know our brand, they know kind of what we stand for, um, they trust us a little bit, now we want them to think that we're the best in our field, right? Because people don't want to just work with anybody, they want to work with someone who's actually going to get them a good deal or give them a good haircut or help them lose 15 pounds. Um, and so building authority is another objective that we would have on our social media. And we would do that, um, by, for example, sharing industry news. So if there's new developments in your industry, uh, that's for realtors where you would share pricing, um, things that are happening in the market, uh, even like new trends for what people are doing to sell their homes, like staging or drone video. You can kind of explain to your audience how the industry is developing. Um, showing your process is incredibly important. Uh, that's actually an exercise that we'll come to in a little bit as well. Your process is the thing that separates you from an amateur. And I'm sure some of the people here who've been in business or doing their craft for a while, you know that you do it now completely differently than the way you did it at the start. And so all those little things that you've learned over time on how to run your business clean, efficient, make your clients happy, all of those little things are the things that make you an expert and all of that's content. So if there's a certain way that you foil hair or if there's a certain time of day that you like to show homes or all of those things, share that with people and it will help them see that you're experienced and that you know about your industry and your work. Another tactic for building authority is evaluating other products or outcomes. So if you're a fitness instructor, you might want to talk about your gym equipment or if new pillows come out, like neck support pillows, you could talk about how it may or may not be a good fit for certain people's bodies. Um, if you're a hair salon, you might want to talk about different products. You probably have tons of them that you sell people. And so each item on the shelf is a social media <coughs> post. You can spread them out over time and kind of, I use this for this and this kind of person who has this hair should use this kind of product. And when people see you explaining that, it just goes into their mind that you're an expert in your, what you do. Um, giving people homework assignments. Uh, so again, if you're a fitness instructor, you might tell people to start a stopwatch and see how many sit-ups they can do in a minute. And then you would say, if you can't do at least 10, you know you have to come and see me. <laughs> if you're a life coach, you might want to give people a journaling exercise, say, you know, sit down tonight and try to write 10 things that you're grateful for. And if you can't do that, maybe you need to spend some time meditating or do some yoga and change your lifestyle. Um, for real estate agents, uh, there's lots of different activities you can give people around decluttering their home or looking at other properties or styles or things that they'd like to see, writing down a list of their must-haves for their future property. So just getting people thinking about the future, about what they want their purchase to look like and how using you would benefit that. And finally, down at the bottom here, I have uh, showing pictures of you at work. This is, again, incredibly important. I have this picture up here. It's of a reflexologist. Um, when we build websites and everything like that for people here, and when reflexologists or people in the wellness industry come to us uh, and they want us to build a website, 
I'll tell you right now, there's a very limited number of pictures on Adobe stock of people rubbing feet, you know? So that means if I use those images, your website is gonna look like so many other people's websites. It's not original content. Similarly, when we see people in photography, on social media, on websites, for the average person, there's almost a sense of celebrity that goes with that. Like, if, if there they are on the homepage doing their craft, your mind automatically thinks, ooh, they must be an expert in their field. They must be really good at what they do. Um, and so that's why I, I recommend to almost every business owner now that a photo shoot is a good business investment for your marketing. I would never have said that 10 years ago, but just with social media being such a hungry beast and having to have your website and um, all of your print materials, having good photography just is so important. And while it's great to have the headshot of you standing in the jacket, like looking super cute, um, it's also really important to show you in the trenches. So if we do a photo shoot with realtors, we show them in consultation with a client or standing in a kitchen pointing at cabinets. Uh, if you're a, a hairstylist, you want to have pictures of you cutting hair or doing some kind of activity like that. And when people see that, they're going to um, feel that level of professionalism and that you're an expert in your field. Um, any questions at all so far? on trust or authority or anything like that. Um, these are some examples of authority posts. So if a client came to us and one of their objectives was to grow their expertise online or to grow their authority, um, these are some ideas that we would give them. So these kinds of posts uh, that we call authority posts usually feature the professional so you can see their face and then right next to them we put a piece of advice or a tip or a statistic and it starts to train people to associate their face uh, with that industry and with that kind of information. You can see these look super professional and they're also sort of all consistent in terms of color and the look of it. So the other thing we're doing with these kinds of posts is training people to recognize our brand, right? Um, and so it's really important, I'll get into it in a couple slides, about choosing a color palette or a look and feel to your business and sticking with it and staying consistent so that people can recognize you and develop a relationship and feelings for your business long term. Um, this is another post here. I actually pulled this from the account Life of a Realtor underscore GTA, which is the Fulton Sisters with Century 21. If you're a real estate agent and you're looking for sort of some guidance on how to have a really great social media account, they're a good account to sort of scope out and see what they're doing. Um, this post here they did uh, for the industry is actually a safety device for realtors to wear when they go places because they're always meeting strangers and going different places. So it's like a little GPS unit and if you're in danger you can click it and they'll send help to the location. So with this post they're showing people that they're educating their team, that they care about their people, that they're on the edge of the technologies that are coming into their industry. There's a lot of subliminal messaging that the brain picks up from a post like this. Uh, similar, similarly, here's a post uh, for a hair salon uh, or hairstylist where again they're just showing, it actually says here, these don't pop without some of this. So it's just showing that you have to put that sort of like dark hair at the bottom to have your highlights pop on top. So that looks like you're almost educating your peers that you know what you're talking about and people who are looking for a certain look are going to think, oh, like she knows, I'm going to get that done there. So. These are just some examples of the kind of authority posts that you could be putting together. Um, and so that brings us to the second exercise here, which is a process breakdown. So you should really take some time, uh, sit down with a cup of coffee and write out what is your process. So from that first touch with the client to the way that you intake them, the way that you talk to them, the way you find out what their needs are, um, how you work on their project, how you close the project up. Make as many notes and bullet points as you can. And once again, each of those bullet points become a social media post. It's another opportunity for you to show people 
how you work, to break down barriers to working with somebody new for the first time. They'll get to know you and your level of expertise. So it's a really good exercise and it will also give you tons of content ideas uh, for your social. Um, a really great um, example is actually a fitness instructor we worked with in the past and we did a Facebook live video of her intake session with a new client. So she sat across the table from a fake client and said, you know, how much weight do you wanna lose? What's your why? What's your comfort level? Um, what are your eating habits like? And she started asking them all of these questions on live video. And she ended up getting seven paid leads from that one video alone. Because when the clients see the process, it makes it look less scary. They think about their own answers to the questions that the person's asking, so their brain already starts the process of moving forward. And they also start to think about or envision you as an expert or someone that they'd wanna work with. So there's lots of value there. Um, when I do this workshop in the healthcare field, so chiropractors or physiotherapists or things like that, they always say to me like, oh, what about confidentiality? Like you can't show a client on camera or anything like that. And so that's what your interns are for. If you have an assistant or like a friend who will come in and sort of pose as a client so that you can get that kind of content, it's a worthwhile activity. Um, I have down at the bottom here as well a little bonus question, which is what do you wish your clients knew about your industry, your fees? I, I hear that all the time from business owners, like if clients only knew that we had to do this, this, and this, and that's why this is held up six weeks, that's an educational post where you can educate your clients about why your business runs the way that it runs. It's a perfect kind of material to put out on your social media. So I'm going to do a couple additional quick tips on the sort of strategy and content side of things and then we'll take a little break before we go on to visuals. Um, the first one here, I just want to revisit a little bit about what people think content is. Um, again, five years ago if you went to a networking meeting, like everybody was telling you that you had to be blogging and if anyone's ever tried to blog, you know that it's a nightmare scenario. <laughs> You're a writer, I think, right? So it's not so bad for you, but yeah. <laughs> Blogging takes time and to sit down and write all that material and spell check it and get it out on your website, is, it's a very time consuming task. It's not necessarily uh, reasonable for a small business owner to be able to do that much. Um, Video solves that problem very quickly because it's very quick, very direct. We could talk about that in a little bit. Um, so here's an example, uh, Red Bull. Everybody kind of recognizes that company. They have really uh, reallocated a lot of their uh, marketing budget away from print and TV ads and instead are sponsoring big events like this crashed ice thing. When they sponsor an event like this, where people are wiping out in the corners, they own all of the video for that. So they get to keep those little video pieces, cut them up, they put them on social, and then we share them for free, right? So you can see down here, this video, which this event's totally on brand for Red Bull, right? Speed, sports, hardcore. Uh, and it's been shared 2.6 uh, thousand times, or viewed 2.6 thousand times. Um, so that material is getting out there via people sharing it for free. So you might want to think about for your business, what are events or activities that you could do? A podcast is a good example where you have like one activity, which is the podcast, and then you start to pull it apart and make five minute clips or one 30 second clips, little short pieces. And then from maybe the things that you said in your podcast, you can pull out little quotes that you put on still images. And so from one activity, you're actually pulling out 30 or 40 pieces of content that you can schedule over a long period of time. So events can be very useful for creating content. Uh, this example here, uh, this gentleman, Cherico Pottery, is someone who spins pottery in a studio in his backyard in his garage. Uh, you can see down here, he has 335,000 views. He basically set up his phone on a shelf, put on Facebook Live, and just works. He has 
indie music playing in the background and he just has a really good time. Uh, all of his material is pretty much sold before it hits his website because people saw him make it and they love that and it's creative process that they don't get to see every day. Um, this is a good reminder for everybody that the things you do every day that seem boring and like just a natural part of your day, people would love to watch that. And I'm sure you've seen videos of people snipping hair or like even like a good shampoo job, like that will captivate a person and they'll watch your content for a minute and a half while you shampoo somebody's hair. So you also want to think about those little parts of your day um, that you could film, that you could take pictures of that someone who isn't in your industry might think is special or interesting. Yep. Yeah. Um, now, is there a specific time frame that we should be kind of thinking about when we are posting a video? Um, time frame and like what time of day to put it out? Yeah, like attention span, like what are people viewing oh. the video wanting to maybe see, and, you know? Yeah. If you're talking about how long the video should be, usually I tell people you can keep it super short. When people first venture into doing video, they kind of like sit the camera in front of them and they think they have to talk and then they talk for three minutes and keep repeating themselves. So I think the important thing is to give people value. So if you are talking, get to the point really quickly and then shut the video off before you start rambling. So aim for short, which is usually better because people like little bites of stuff. They a lot of people don't watch even past 30 seconds. Now that said, if you're shampooing someone's hair, I would film that for two minutes if you need to because when people are done with it, they'll click away and there are people who've had a long day and their kids have been screaming and crying and they're laying in bed and they just wanna watch it. Like they just wanna numb out, right? So it just depends on the nature of the material that you're putting out. But as a guideline, I would say as short as possible. Good question though. Um, so really quickly, another concept I like to talk about is push versus pull marketing. So marketing used to be very push, right? Like very aggressive, buy this now, get it, you're, you're a loser if you don't have this thing, or there's only three left. So very aggressive. Social media is not a good space for that. It doesn't work very well on social media, um, where it's a much more chill kind of environment for people. Um, so what we see happening is the rise of the influencer or the blogger who goes out and just lives their best life, right? They have a great time. They celebrate their lifestyle. Um, if you're a real estate agent, you can do this very easily. Like, look at me. It's 2 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, and I'm driving through the country, or I'm enjoying the downtown, or I'm having lunch. Like, think about the things about your job that are excellent and amazing and celebrate those things. Uh, what happens is the people online who have started to trust you and who follow you will emulate the things that you do. So a lot of people will follow a blogger and if she puts on a shade of lipstick, she'll say, oh, this is the latest shade for fall. I just love it. Don't you think it matches the color of the sweater? And 10 people will run out to buy that product. So she doesn't have to push sell. She just kind of pulls people along with her. And so, again, that's why I tell people to celebrate the profession or the career path that you have chosen. And with your content, just make everyone feel like you're having the best time ever and they will follow behind you and start to do the things that you do and purchase the things that you purchase. And again, that goes back to that idea of that circle of advisors. And I'm sure the people here, you can probably think of someone that you follow online who, if they did something or went to a restaurant, you would probably go to that same place. So that's pull marketing rather than push. Um, and that's also a good reminder for everyone to always be cultivating their own influence. Like we think about influencers as, and bloggers as people getting all this free product and creating all this content online, but you could be a really great influencer for a shampoo company if they see you doing those videos and you're getting lots of followers and lots of likes and you're really like celebrating the product in the video they're going to see that and they're going to want to share your content and make sure that you're using their product so um, pretty much everyone who's in in business right now should be thinking about how to cultivate and grow their own influence 
um, and be like a representative for their suppliers um, and the other organizations that they work with. Um, another quick psychology point, and I actually love this one. Um, the human brain is still pretty primitive at a lot of levels. And uh, subconsciously, our mind is always checking to see if we're in a safe location, right? And the easiest way for my brain to tell that I'm in a safe space is for me to look at your faces and your eyes are soft and you're smiling and you guys look relaxed, which means there's probably no lions or tigers behind me, right? So what happens is uh, we become very used to being reassured by seeing a human face. So if I go to the homepage of your website and I'm scrolling around and I don't see any pictures of a human face, a sense of anxiety starts to build up and without realizing why, I'm gonna click the back button and navigate away. Or if I'm scrolling through your Instagram feed and I'm not seeing any faces, there's no eyes, again, that sense of anxiety builds up and I navigate away. Now, subsequently, if I'm scrolling and that anxiety is growing and then all of a sudden I see a picture of you and you look happy and relaxed, my brain starts to associate those warm, safe feelings with you and your face. So like, it's just the perfect activity uh, to be doing online, is to be sharing pictures of yourself. Grows your authority, grows your trust. It gets people at like a, a chemical, psychological level feeling safe with you. Um, eyes also anchor the reader. So if you have really important content on your website, like a person will scan a website and then they'll lock eyes with a photo and then they usually read the piece of content that's next to the human face. So if you have something like a really important offer or like a compelling question that you ask people, you often want to position that right next to a photo of a face. Uh, this also means that you have to take a selfie sometimes, right, for your business and take some pictures um, of yourself. So usually when I tell my clients to take a selfie, I don't mean like right up in your face, like this far away where people can see your wrinkles and judge you and all that kind of stuff. You want to hold the phone really far out. And when you do that, you can position your face down in the lower corner and you make the photo about what's happening behind you. So you can take a picture and say like, I just cleaned the back room, what do you guys think of it? And it's mostly like the shelves and your face is down in the lower corner, right? Or you can say, here I am at Rib Fest, love supporting the community. And so you're getting your own face on your social media and it doesn't have to be a headshot every time. Uh, content creation is the future, again, of, of marketing for small business. Going back to that idea at the start that if you have to be putting out 50 to 75 pieces of content a week, that is a big job. So um, if you are a leader, I recommend creating content and then sharing it and giving it out to other people because other businesses, other business owners are starving for easy stuff that they can post really quickly and set it and forget it. So if you are a brokerage or a franchise or a supplier or if you are a team leader, create content that you can pass out to your people and have them post as well. It gives you more control over the brand and what your business looks like um, and also gives people easy things to share. This is an example post that we did uh, for the Oshawa Center. So they were hosting a pop-up market um, in, in the mall and so we created like a framework in the brand colors that said find me at the OC and business owners could switch out this photo and use that content. We also gave them a series of other pre-made social media posts that they could just put up that says I'm going to be at the Oshawa Center Friday the 22nd. And so by the Oshawa Center giving, you know, 15 to 20 vendors that material, those 15 to 20 vendors all shared that material over the week coming up to the event. So the event was everywhere. It looked like everyone was going. People were seeing other business owners and thinking, ooh, I wanna shop with them. And so their attendance really increased. So it's something that you wanna think about for sure. If you're a business that's planning to scale is what kind of content can you create for your people and give them to keep their posting levels up.
Cool, so this is the visual section, so we'll take a little break and a breather. And I think everyone's like a little tense maybe because the cameras are here, so we can like relax a bit. Um, if anyone has to go to the washroom or grab a coffee, we can do that um, and just stretch and then we'll do the, the middle part. Awesome. Okay, so usually our first piece of advice to companies when it comes to creating uh, brand visuals uh, and upgrading sort of the look of their social media is to develop a solid brand aesthetic. So again, like step number one for that for me is really choosing a color palette and sticking to it. Um, what I have up here are actually mood boards that we use uh, to sort of make sure that we're on the same page with a client before we invest time and money in creating their brand from scratch. So we would pitch them sort of a look and a feel uh, and a concept for their company along with a color palette for them to approve before we go to next steps. This is an activity that you could do yourself. Um, again, it creates a focus and a look and kind of tells you what kind of content you should be putting on your own feeds. Uh, choosing a color palette and sticking to it really helps clients recognize your business. Um, if I'm online and I see your content, you know, day after day after day, but it looks different every time, there, I may not realize it's you. And so you're losing that emotional equity that you could be building with your clients. Um, this is another example where I see that idea of the tail wagging the dog, where people are starting to design their offices and their brand colors, and you're purchasing your office supplies and your pens and your paper clips in your brand colors so that you can take pictures really quickly in your office or in your studio or whatever, and that content goes up on your feed and it all looks consistent and really sharp. That's all right. <laughs> um, does everybody here have a color palette for their business, really, that they're sticking to? Yeah? Okay, that's good. And you have a look. Um, another good tip for social media is to choose repetitive visual cues. Uh, so those are certain things in your business that you might take pictures of repeatedly. Um, this is a quick screen grab from um, a company that I follow online called Full Candles, at F-U-L Candles. Um, and you can see on here that she's repeatedly using images of her dog, the letter board. She has this like black and white buffalo check that she keeps using, and then obviously photos of her product. So because she does that so consistently, when I see these images, I think instantly of her business. I recognize it really quickly. If I'm out in the world and I see a dog like this, I start thinking about her candles and her product. So she's found a way to anchor her business in my mind and make me think about her when she's not around. So um, having repetitive visual cues can really help um, not only your clients recognize you, but it makes it easier for you to post. Like if you know every five to 10 posts, you're gonna do a picture of your dog or your desk or whatever, it just makes it easier for you to create content. So some things that you can do repetitively would be, again, sticking to the same colors, um, if there's like certain items or people that you're gonna share continually, um, locations or themes or a certain style that you're going to pick and stay consistent with. Um, another real estate agent that we worked with, we did a photo shoot with her and she had this super cute photo of her standing in front of the front door of the house holding her purse like this and the photo like chopped her head off so it was really just about like her purse and her shoes and this super cute front door behind her. And the photo looked so good that she started doing it in front of all of her houses. So every time she got a new listing, she did a new photo of her standing in front. And so really great repetitive thing. And now every time a client sees that, they're gonna be like, that girl's got a new listing. So now she looks successful and there's a way for her clients to measure that she's doing a lot of work. So um, really good idea there. Um, so exercise how many people are editing their photos right now that they take you're editing you're editing you guys are editing okay so you guys not so much yet okay we um, put some items on the table here when you guys edit what what programs are you using Lightroom. You're, you use Lightroom okay that's fantastic Lightroom and Canva, Lightroom and Canva. 
Okay, cool. Um, we recommend and train sort of like in this program an app called Snapseed, which is a free photo editor, but I totally recommend Lightroom. Snapseed's good for beginners. Um, Lightroom's also great. That's the one that you can purchase presets and things for. Um, and Canva's great too, especially for like making more complex sort of graphics. Um, really quickly, I'm gonna show everyone Snapseed here. Now I put some things on the table just to do some really quick tips when it comes to styling. So if you are on a day where you don't have content or you're trying to take better pictures for your social media, um, a couple of things to keep in mind when you're like setting up your desk. So, or like let's say we wanna take a photo here. You wanna have various heights. So usually a tall thing, a medium thing, and some small things works really great when you're shooting across this way. Also, really cultivate white space. And by white space, I mean like brown, green, black space, it doesn't matter, but uh, when you look at people's Instagram feeds, the one that people find the most attractive are the ones that the photos are simple and clean. If they're really cluttered and heavy, when you land on that sort of feed, it's very overwhelming to the eye and it affects how many people will actually click the follow button. Um, so if we were gonna take pictures here, um, what I recommend to clients too is batching. So batching means that you're going to do a lot of activities at once, store up a lot of photos so that later on when you go to post you have lots to work with. So if you are bored one afternoon or, or something like that and you have your desk in front of you, you can snap some photos maybe going this way. You can take flat lays down like this. This looks really good if I do this. And you can find little places in your office where you can grab certain photos. A good tip is your business card, especially if you love your business card and it's really pretty, is you could drop your business card down here, take this shot, and it's like a perfect piece of material that you can put on your social media. And that's the kind of content that you can create that fits in nicely with a lot of the exercises that we did earlier. So if you're gonna be talking about your brand or, or something like that, Maybe you want to take a picture of the shelves in your salon and how neatly they're arranged because quality really matters to you or something like that. So um, when it comes to photo editing, again, we recommend Snapseed. And when I open up Snapseed, it gives me access to my camera roll and I can click here on the photo that I just took. And you can see that it might be a little bit dark. So if I click on tools, it gives me the option for brightness, I can lift it right up. So I'll go too far, but you can see how bright that is. Or I can make it darker. But usually you wanna lift your photos up and that gives the photo that magazine kind of quality look to it. So for real estate agents, if you're in a really beautiful house and it has this gorgeous master bathroom and it looks so pretty and so you take a picture in there or you jump in the tub and just be like, look at the size of this bathtub. And then when you look at the photo, it looks very dark and it's just like not selling it. So that's something that you would edit in Snapseed. So you can, or Lightroom or something like that. But lifting up that light, um, there's lots of options on here like saturation, um, shadows, warmth. Warmth is a good one if you're taking a lot of photos and they're yellow, which can happen if you have like lighting in your office makes everything look yellow. So you can play with that as well and take a yellow photo and just chill it out a little bit. So this gives you a little bit of an editor in your pocket uh, situation. The other thing I really like about um, this program is that in my tool drawer again, if I click on tools down here, it does give me a text option. So. I can choose lots of different fonts and different colors to create my own graphics. So if you are on a tight budget or something and you want to create those authority posts, you can have a friend take a picture of you next to a white wall, blank wall, or you're doing something like this, open it in Snapseed, do a little editing, and then put your sort of power quote or fact right beside you. And so you're getting some basic graphic design done while you're standing in line at the bank, right? Um, any questions about photo editing or styling? Are people here fairly comfortable taking photos? Yeah, okay. Um, really quick tips again, just trying height and shot variations. Design and buy things in your brand colors. 
So if you have a fitness studio, maybe you want to get skipping ropes that match the colors of the, of the rest of the brand. Um, also, don't discourage people from creating content. So I see this again in offices where, you know, the entire business is starving to death for content and someone takes five minutes to be on social media or take a, a picture and people are like, stop wasting time or something like that. So creating content is a job. It's something that has to happen at your work. And I hear even from real estate teams, especially assistants, where you guys have to be putting content out every single day and the agents maybe aren't supporting you because they're not giving you any photos or content or anything. Um, in situations like that, it's useful to give them uh, homework exercises. So send me a picture of your pet this week or show me pictures of your boots like standing on the doormat of your home that you're about to list. Like if you give them little picture prompts, they might help out and give you guys some of the content that you need to put out there. Um, and finally, take lots of pictures and don't post in real time. I'm telling you guys to do a lot of things for your social media and if you try to snap a photo, edit it, write brilliant content and post it all in real time, like you will suffer. <laughs> it's not easy and we don't have enough time for that. Um, so I really recommend batching. So that's if I set up my desk for photos, make sure you're taking 15 and try to make them different. Switch out the plant, switch out the notebook, open the notebook and flip it to another page, write a message on a blank page, get enough pictures from that one activity to make it worthwhile. And then just put your phone in your purse or pocket. And then later on, when you're at your kid's soccer game or you're stuck waiting in line somewhere, that's when you can start editing and sort of scheduling your content. Um, I want to touch really quickly on video. Uh, video is so powerful and I know that people usually don't feel comfortable on video cameras. It's something that you really have to push yourself into doing a little bit. Video makes such a bigger impression on people because they can hear your voice, they can see your expression, they just get a better feel for who you are as a person. So it really takes down those barriers of them wanting to start a relationship or buy something from you very, very quickly. Um, also, from a technical standpoint, there's a supply and demand problem in that, um, I guess even a year ago, um, less than everybody's watching video, but less than 20% of users are updating or, or uploading original content. So the social media platforms have a supply and demand problem. So if you put <coughs> video out there, you're going to get dramatically increased reach just because the algorithms need to put that content out. So video is very much to your advantage in every way. Um, if you are baby stepping your way into video, Instagram and Facebook stories are the perfect place to do that. So for the people who aren't terribly familiar with Instagram yet, the Instagram stories, which I have some slides about it coming up, but there are these little bubble circles up at the top here. This content deletes after 24 hours. So you can put something up there that's silly, campy, very casual. You can make mistakes. It's, it's not very big deal because it's going to be gone by tomorrow. Um, on the flip side of that, having material up here in the stories is really powerful because the number of hours that people spend watching Instagram stories now rivals television. People are spending a lot of time up here. So if I, if I click on one of these videos and I'm, you know, maybe watching my girlfriend's trip or something that she's doing out in the field, <laughs> Um, the next video that pops up uh, could be your company and what's going on there and what's happening. So it's almost like the equivalent of having a television commercial for your business to be up there and be present. So this is a great space um, to start is the stories because it's not permanent and they're very, very short. The video content that you should be putting on stories is like 15 to 30 seconds. Um, also, if you're not comfortable with video, <clears throat> excuse me, especially for real estate agents, you can start by not pointing the camera at yourself. So if you're at an open house and no one's shown up yet, 
you can click the camera on and just like walk through the kitchen and be like, look at this gorgeous kitchen. Like, don't you wish you had this pantry or something? But if you're not comfortable talking, just do a quiet walkthrough of it and people will still watch that. A lot of people watch videos without the sound on, so you could get hundreds of views before people even realize you're not talking. So there's lots of ways to baby step your way into uh, creating video content. Once you get started, you're gonna realize how much faster and easier it is. It's so easy to like pop up your phone, say a two second message, turn it off and post. It's, it's so much better than writing. So if you can get over that hump of being comfortable on camera, um, it's such a better tool for your business just at every level. Um, and again, really encouraging people to step out from behind your business and be present on your social media and video will definitely help you do that. Um, how many, who here was an assistant again that's responsible for the social media? You are. So are you ever on the social? Um, sometimes I'll put content of my family or me out and about, yeah. Yeah. I might even create like a story about how like I'm, I'm the social media manager here supporting all these agents and like what am I going to post today and like almost make a story about how you're trying to make these people entertaining and fun and how you're trying to get content out of them and be like let's see what they're doing today in the field and see which of the agents can send you something back by the end of the day, that kind of stuff. Um, oh, here is my slide on Instagram stories. Um, so again, these are the, these guys up here, these little bubbles, gone after 24 hours. So very easy to use, um, very uh, forgiving in a very casual space. If you create content in your stories that is stellar good and you're like, oh, that is a very good video. I kind of don't want it to be gone in 24 hours. Then you can share it to your highlights which are like little sections at the top of your profile page that share, uh, saves video for long term. Now for real estate agents, what I strongly recommend is do a home tour on the Instagram stories. So here's the big garage that we all wish we had, the stunning backyard, beautiful kitchen, and then you can save it on here as like 123 Smith Street. So as a client, if I came on your feed, I can see all the properties that you have, and if I click on those, I can see tours of them which you created really simply, maybe before the open house starts. Um, and then for you, if you wanted to do, like you can do one that's all colors or one that's your process that again shows you like taking people through the whole entire sequence of events. Um, hair is very easy because it's so visual, right? So it's not difficult probably for you to create content. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and if you are trying to create an aesthetic or make your Instagram feed look really beautiful, um, I've talked about this before, you can kind of pin yourself into a corner, right? Where like if all your pictures are pink and white and then you take the kids out to the park and nothing in the park matches your Instagram feed, it's almost like, well, I can't use that photo. So that's why I use the stories to put up all my content that I don't want mucking up my feed. So it's a really good outlet for that. Um, the other thing on Instagram stories, which I'll just show you really quickly too, is the boomerang features um, and some of the super zooms. Have you or do you use these? So if I click on the super zoom, for example, this is my favorite one. It's a nope. So if I film this like this, so you could say like if someone's doing a bad fitness practice or, or stretching the wrong way or if they're putting a product in their hair like box color you could film this even at shoppers drug mart and just have that big stop sign come up and be like don't use this product blah 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 so there's lots of things in here that make creating content really quick and easy that don't take a lot of thought um, the one I like too is the boomerang feature so those are very short clips that repeat over and over so that there's like quick movement um, and like on a day when you're burnt out and you're just like, I know I need to post, but I don't have anything today. That's when I pull out the boomerang and I show the coffee going in the mug, out of the mug, in the mug, out of the mug. And I'm like, it's a two cup of coffee day, right? So um, very easy, accessible content up there. 
Um, so editing your photos, we've kind of talked about again. It, this is a classic example of what I was saying earlier about the increasing cost of creative. So if your business isn't making an effort to make your photos better looking, to make your content more engaging, to post more regularly, if your competitor is doing that and they're fun and they're telling these great jokes and they're showing this engaging video, they're just going to erode away at your market share. And so a lot of the social media activities that you're doing are almost defensive, right? It's like these are my followers and they're loyal to me and so you're keeping them engaged with you so that they can't be poached off by someone else. So it's definitely something to think about. Um, really quickly as well, I'll just show you guys some example editing styles. So right here, um, this is an account at Birch and Baker, which is run by our uh, stylist here in the office, and she does a lot of baking. When she edits her photos, she uses a high saturation, high contrast, high shadow, and it gives her photos like a moody kind of dark look to them. Um, and then this is Flash Adams, who's our photographer, and she uses like low contrast, low saturation, high brightness, and this gives her photos a very like ethereal, bright, misty kind of look to them. So both of these are edited in Snapseed, and so you can see how you can create two very different looks. And again, it almost becomes an element of your brand in the way that you end up tr liking to edit your photos. Um, don't force it. Don't be like, this is what my editing style is going to be like, and you try to make every photo look like that. I think it's easier to, you know, over a period of two or three weeks, take a lot of photos, edit them all just the way that you like it, and then look back over it and see what kind of styles naturally emerging. It's easier to work that way um, to see who you really are rather than trying to fit yourself into a box that doesn't fit. Similarly, you may have a style that emerges because of the lighting that's available in your office or your house or the places where you frequently take pictures. It may just not facilitate some styles. So it's better to uh, get some practice before you commit to anything. Um, again, this is another quick example of a photo that we took. It's just of this cutting board with some brie cheese on it. And we did the downward photo. And then I edited in Snapseed, I cut off the extra and I added two text boxes in Snapseed. And so we made our own graphic on our phone super easy. Uh, so that's a way, like if you wanted to say that there's an open house or a new listing or anything like that, you could probably make a lot of those graphics on your phone. All right. So I'm going to move into engagement and growth and sort of um, developing your presence online from a more technical standpoint. Engagement is the secret sauce. Um, if you were going to tell me the fastest way to grow your business online, it's actually probably not posting. It's engaging. Um, the algorithms love it. They love it if you're out liking and commenting on other things because you look like an engaged user and that's what they're trying to encourage. Um, people love it. Your clients love seeing a comment on their posts. Like if someone got a haircut from you and then three weeks later you wrote on it and you're like, girl, that still looks fantastic. I love the way you're styling it. That makes people feel so good and it increases that loyalty factor for them wanting to stay with you long term. Yep. Yep. You can't make lists. Uh, you can see a list of all of your followers. But you can't group them. No, not really. No. That's what I, I, was, that's what I thought, but yeah. Yeah. Um, that would be fantastic if you could, but you can't. Yeah. Um, engagement is also not passive, right? Uh, yep. So I have a question related to that. Yeah. One thing I've noticed, even since I did the Instagram one, because I think our engagement's better, we're using hashtags a lot more. Now we're getting a lot of like, stuff in our feed that's actually based on that stuff, like hashtags and yeah. relevant to the algorithm saying, hey, this stuff's coming in, but that's not necessarily our local people, but we want to engage more with the local people. Yep. I'd like to, but they don't necessarily come up as much because all these other things are coming up now. Right. So, I, so it's, you got to tell them how I I will, to go and look for them as opposed to yeah. coming to me, which that's is fine, possible. but mm -hmm. there's no way to really like work around that. Not 
Instagram anyway. I can give you a bit of a workaround for that um, in a slide, one slide away. So oh, I'll okay. show you how to do that um, for sure. Um, a lot of people go on social media and they post and then exit, right? They don't spend time on there or anything like that and they're not meeting new people online so they've taken the social out of social media. Um, one of the things that it makes sense to hire out for, like if you are going to have someone assist you or pay to outsource some aspect of your social media, I recommend the engagement. It, it's, I pay an intern sometimes 100 bucks a week to engage for our companies. On our Instagram account, our weekly visitors can be around 275 people. On the weeks when my intern is engaging on behalf of the business, it goes up to 900. Like it makes a significant difference. And that's 900 people physically coming to my profile page and looking at my posts. So it really makes a big difference. Um, and again, it's most effective when it's done in a targeted way. And I usually hear this from people who are like, well, I'm getting all these followers from California and they're never going to buy from me because they're so far away. So we want to retrain the algorithms that your desired client base and follower base is something local. Um, the first step, when you sign into something like Instagram, uh, on your notifications right here, when it opens up, it tells you all the activities that have happened since you've last been on. So you can see here it says, Jay Stone liked your photo, she commented, she liked your photo. So her sort of profile image or logo shows up one, two, three times there. And you can see down here, Suspicious Package liked something once and twice, so their logo's two times there. So when you're engaging on someone else's account, if you like or comment three or four images, your logo is going to show up in someone's notifications one, two, three, four times. Now for most users when they see that, they're like, oh, who is that? Like I don't recognize that person. And so they'll click on, the, on your name here and go through and look at your profile page. So that's how you're getting those people who aren't followers who have never seen your business before to click through and take a look at you. Now, the best way to do that strategically is to find local businesses. Really good examples are restaurants, coffee shops, um, community centers, any, anything like that where you know that most of their followers are going to be local people. On Instagram up here, so this is our um, profile page, and you can see up here it says our number of posts, and here's our followers and who we're following. So if I click on this, the followers, you actually get to see a full list of all the people who are following Brand Ambition. So then you can click through each of these and engage on their posts. So if you go to Harvest Restaurant in Brooklyn, if that's your area where you want to be farming or bringing your clients from, click on Harvest Restaurant, go through their followers, like, 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 comment, you're dropping your logo three or four times in their notifications and almost selecting where you want your new followers to come from. So in your situation, instead of just blindly engaging, I would do it in that targeted way of like choosing businesses that are around you. So you're talking about the actual, going to the actual business uh, and commenting on them specifically, but also their followers as well? Yeah, so for me, well, nobody can tell or know that you're yeah. doing it. So for example, if I go to Harvest, let's see what comes up, Harvest Brooklyn. So I know that most of the people who are following this restaurant are likely going to live in Durham region. So I'm going to click on their followers and I'll go through to this person. She's um, a blocked page, uh, so I just move on from that. I'll check on this person. Their feed's going to open up if I have good signal. And I will like, 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 I love your sweater. I, that's a great beach. I love that restaurant. Anything like that on a photo so that we can come up. Or like here, oh my gosh, that looks like an awesome concert. Click, click, click. And that's going to put my logo in her notifications one, two, three, four times. That sounds like a big process. But if you're sitting in front of Netflix in the evening or you're watching a show or something, it actually goes really quickly. And I do that as an exercise for myself. I just pick different places or hashtags, which I'll show you in a second, and I go through it and engage with those people. I guess, I guess my question was more just like, is it, is it imposing for 
them to all of a sudden have a brand sort of pop up and does it feel like it's too? I, I don't think so. It's m much easier in B2B, business to business. Sure, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, for people, I avoid clicking on like intimate pictures of right. their children and stuff like that, but it's still, I don't think offensive because everybody likes to see some comments. Like they're posting on social for people to see their content, right? I just wanted to be genuine too. Like for yeah. me, it'd be easy to pick on, if they, especially if they're doing something athletic or active for me, just to yeah. comment on that would make sense. But yeah, yeah. like yeah. a nice, nice costume, Halloween costume on your kid today would be like, oh, what do you think? What's this guy doing? Yeah, exactly. You know, I, wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to have the wrong message for it, that's all. Uh, the perfect scenario for you might be following people who follow Copper Branch, which is like a health food. Yeah. So you know they're already in that mindset. And then if you look at their posts and there's their salad and, you know, they're having barbecue that day, I would comment, mm, that looks delicious yeah. or where'd you get that or something yeah, like those that. healthy eating places are kind of an obvious link for sure. Yeah. And that's where, like, everyone's Style. soft social skills come into play where you got to find the comments that are polite and personal but not intimate, right? As opposed to, why the hell are you eating that thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Stay positive. Right? Yeah. Stay positive whenever you can. I find that genuine comments are really nice, <coughs> flattering. Yeah. Um, but I do find that you know when you get those ad type comments, like you know, come to my page and you yeah, know, or the selling of the service is kind of irritating to. I would never advise that, and in my experience, we don't have to do that mm -hmm. at all. And you can experiment with this very easily if you spend an evening writing the genuine comments. The next time you look at your notifications you'll see how many people wrote back to you or were like, thank you so much, or answered your questions. So you get feedback right away on what's working and not working. Um, sorry, can I just ask a question? Yeah. So if I go to, like say for example, the area that we farm, yep. and I type that in, and then I pull up the, the local community association, yep. so I would go to their followers, mm -hmm. find a business, and then do I follow that business? You don't necessarily have to follow it if you don't want to. Oh, okay. So yep. If you just click on their follower followers. list, you'll see those people there. Another option up here, if I search, um, let's say Whitby as a town. So there's Whitby, Ontario. And I click on it. It's going to show me the top posts in Whitby right here, as well as the most recent posts. So this is another... This, these are people that you know posted from Whitby or use the hashtag Whitby. So that's another place where if you don't feel comfortable going to another business and scoping out their followers, you could do it this way. Um, so there's lots of things on here where you could click on and be like, oh, that's a cute decoration or I might try this craft with my kids or something like that. How many times a week should we be doing this? Um, as many as you realistically can. Uh, the more you do it, the more you get back on it, which again is why I have an intern do it as much as possible. Um, Cause it's, a, like, it's lead generation that we see pay off for sure. That train is gonna be a lot. So I might just like cut <laughs> while we wait for the train to go past. Are there any other questions actually while we are taking a mini break for the train? <laughs> Um, so yeah, searching by location, uh, the other thing that's really great is hashtags. Uh, so if there are certain hashtags you follow, um, I'm trying to think of a local one, but it even could be like um, Whitby Rib Fest. And if you search that hashtag, you can go through it and then again, just engage with those people. Yeah. All right. I'm going to repeat this one just for the camera, and I think we're good on the train, so I'm going to start again. I'll make, like, a motion. <laughs> um, so you can also, up in the search field, put in uh, different hashtags. So, again, locations, uh, businesses, or if there's certain hashtags for your industry, you can use those. Um, when I click on it, again, I'm going to see the top posts right here and then if I click here I'll see the most recent so it's just giving me access to people that I know are in my area or are interested in my product or industry that I can engage with and click on uh, and sort of drop my logo in their notifications 
Um, you can also save time by following hashtags that are relevant to your business. So we follow the hashtag, uh, hashtag small business or hashtag Durham region or hashtag do it in Durham. So we would follow those hashtags so that that content comes up in our feed and I just know to engage with those people when I see them come up naturally in my feed. Does everybody here feel confident with the kind of hashtags they're selecting for their business or that they're using? Okay, I'll touch on that a little bit, but I won't go like too heavy on it. Is there, is there a point in your post where I like, see people that have like 100 hashtags? Like, mm -hmm. are, they, are they all there just for functional reasons or do you, is it, does that, to me that seems kind of obnoxious. Like I usually use like right. four, or five, four or five things in as opposed to someone who might have like seven lines of hashtags. For sure. It, yeah. For some reason it does seem obnoxious, doesn't it? Yeah. For people to have too many hashtags. It feels like you're trying to do something for yourself as opposed to actually posting something that you should be for someone else, which is right. that I try to make. When I put a comment in on um, my social, so here I would like write my sort of caption, I do uh, like a period, enter, period, enter, period, enter, and it puts a little space and then I bury my hashtag cloud down at the bottom. So that means most people aren't actually seeing it okay. and it's less obnoxious. Right. Um, Sorry. Yep. Mm -hmm. Some people do that and I think that in some cases it's better because when clients are scrolling past it says that the um, post has one comment and nobody wants to be first. So usually if there's already one comment they're more likely to add a second or third. Um, I'm not convinced that putting the hashtags in the comments is the strongest application for them. I think they're stronger in the post. But again, I know tons of top bloggers who insist on putting it in the, in the comments, so it must be working for them. I, I can't give you a definitive answer on that. Um, I usually recommend having between eight to 15 hashtags is usually pretty good. So you're, you mean the, you, you're commenting as yourself and then you put the hashtag in so that you have like a bunch of comments from you in your own post? Oh no, I just mean when you're crafting a post. Yeah. So I write my caption and then I put in yeah. about 10 to 15 hashtags. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Back for her? Question, yeah. yeah, so what she's saying is that you create your caption and you click post, and once it's up, you yeah. go back and comment on your own post with all of the hashtags. But then, yeah, so when people go to comments, it's just you commenting on yourself? Yeah, it's hashtags? the first comment is just a hashtag yeah. cloud. Right. Is there any benefit like to putting a hashtag, like if I go on her page, yeah. and, and is there a benefit, and I comment, is there a benefit to putting a hashtag in my comment on her page? Um, you can do it. I don't know if there's necessarily benefits to it, but like um, if somebody made like a funny post about their cat eating a piece of lettuce or something and I was like, ha ha ha, hashtag vegan cat. Like I might do that just to make a joke or something. So that's fine. Um, otherwise, I don't think it really serves you in any way. The other thing too is you might have like a hashtag for your business. So I, I think it would be invasive if I went on another person's post and said hashtag brand ambition, like I probably wouldn't do that. So there isn't really a benefit to it that I could foresee. I also have a little tip also for everybody. Is, um, if you Google Instagram um, space generator or um, the other one, there's another one, I think it's a bar. So you really can actually make spaces in your post so that you're not, it's not like you have to put periods or whatever. Oh, yeah. Name, so that you yeah. can separate it and it looks nice and clean. So you have it. Yeah, and then it, you can say con copy and convert and then just yeah, copy it over to your post. Okay, that's cool. That might, I've seen that lately where people are using custom fonts in their Instagram, which is like very, you notice it right away. Yeah, for sure. Um, thank you. Um, I go to, I'll talk about tagging and collaboration and then after that I have a slide about hashtagging so if we missed anything we'll like retap it. Um, most people here probably know how to tag. That's when you do the little at symbol and then you start sort of typing a business and it'll <coughs> pop up. And then, that's okay. Uh, you can click on it here and it comes up creating a live link. Um, so when you do that, uh, put tags in your post, you're telling the algorithms that the content 
is for a selection of your followers, but also for a selection of the followers of this other business. So you increase your organic reach every time you use a tag and you add another business. It's almost like partnering up online. So it's not necessarily just so that they see it and maybe they do something with it. It actually, it actually, actually yeah. their people as well. And you can tell that if you've ever recall seeing on your own feed, it'll say like, Judy has liked this thing or Judy is, has mentioned this place or this restaurant and you'll see that in your own feed. So it's a way of introducing you to new content you always want to be um, thinking about ways that you can strategically tag people. So for real estate agents, if you have home inspectors, take a picture of their truck in the driveway, tag their company in the post, right? Um, or if there's a cleaning company that you hire to come in before the house goes up for sale, or if you have repairmen or like any of the partners, someone comes in to take your interior photos, tag, tag, tag as much as possible. Um, Tagging can also put you on the radar of your suppliers. So if you want to be an influencer and get sent free shampoo, then start tagging like Revlon or whatever companies, if you work with Devine's, is that how you say that name? I'm not sure, but Davinus. Davinus. So you can tag those companies and then they are going to see that you're promoting their content. Um, so a quick list on who to tag, suppliers, your neighbors. So if you have a store or shops next to you, I like tagging them because then you're almost like retapping their client base that already knows that location and reminding them that you're there. Um, your top customers um, or products that you review. Again, if the gym is reviewing the latest skipping rope or weight loss equipment or whatever, then you would write a review for that and tag that company. Um, if you go to networking events, it always makes me laugh so much. Like people will go to a networking event and they'll sit at this lovely table with 10 other business owners and nobody takes a picture. And if you just took one, you could tag like five, six different businesses in it and get so much out of that post. So again, always be taking pictures if you can. Um, if you have people at your table, just a fun hint or whatever, who don't like having their photo taken, you can have all of the business owners at the table put their cards down and then take a picture of the collection of business cards. So it's just a good way of like getting around it if someone doesn't want to do that. Make that person take the picture. Hmm? Make that person take the picture. Yes, there's your other good tip. Yeah, exactly. Um, just a quick note on this tagging and collaboration. Again, it goes back to that concept that I brought up at the very beginning of the workshop about building your brand equity. For us, like we did a big event in the springtime, uh, a launch party, and we even chose our caterer. Like we picked a person who had really active social media who shares posts of the kinds of events that they go to. And again, for that event, we pre-made some content. So we gave them a post that says, will be the caterer at 182 West launch party and, and they want content too so they put it up. So the activity and the engagement levels that you have on social media makes it a very easy way for people to evaluate whether or not they should be working or partnering with you and it adds value to your business and your reputation and your brand. Um, really quickly, this was my slide on hashtags, which we kind of jumped ahead a bit earlier, but that's fine. Um, hashtags kind of have levels as well. There's high level ones like hashtag cat is going to have 42 million people have used that hashtag. So if you use it, your content's really going to get lost in the, in the clouds a little bit. Um, so we kind of recommend using different levels. So like a high level big hashtag, like hashtag cat and then maybe hashtag tabby cat, and then maybe you know apartment living cats or something. So you're kind of getting um, more and more specific with your hashtags. The other thing I recommend about hashtags is usually you do three or four about what's in the photo, a couple hashtags from your industry, and then maybe some for location, and there you are. There's your hashtag cloud. So it just kind of simplifies it a little bit. For 182 West, we always use the hashtag realtor, but then we might use like um, hashtag curb appeal or hashtag red door or things like that mention the actual content in the photo. Um, another side tip for 
real estate agents or any business, you know when you want to share a post about your business and it's got lots of writing on it, like you're like, I really have to tell people that we have a 50% off sale. And so you want to put that up, but it kind of wrecks the aesthetic of what's happening. Um, one of the things you can do is have a cover photo that's really beautiful and it says like swipe for a special message and then they swipe and they see the sort of uglier content. Uh, when it comes to real estate agents, you guys have a tendency to always want to lead with that awful curbside photo of the front of the house, which usually just screams, you know, real estate agent. And if it's this time of year, sometimes the curbside photo is not that nice. So I usually recommend, uh, particularly on Instagram, is start with beautiful pictures from inside the home, like a really beautiful master bathroom or the closet. And so you start with those and then people who are interested in interior design or fashion or furnishings are gonna look at those photos and engage with it. And then when they get to the end, they're like, oh, the house is for sale, I get it. So you're gonna get probably more reach and engagement by starting with that sort of pretty picture and then putting the curbside notice at the end. Does that make sense for everyone? Can I ask another question? Yeah, for sure. So if I go on Instagram and I post Mm -hmm. um, does that automatic, um, automatically go over to the Facebook account that it's tied to? Or? You can set it up for that so that whatever you post on Instagram automatically goes to Facebook. Right. Um, there's a couple of things that I would note with that, which is that if you have a giant hashtag cloud on your Instagram and then it auto posts to Facebook, it's going to send the hashtag cloud too. And for some reason, like if people hate hashtags on Instagram, they double hate them on mm -hmm. Facebook. Okay. So you don't want to have that. Um, also, as soon as it's realistically possible for you, you want to have slightly different content on your Instagram than you do on your Facebook. I wouldn't worry about it off the hop. Like if you're just trying to ramp up and get yourself on a healthy schedule, then you don't want to overwhelm yourself. But in time, try to make those posts unique. Otherwise, there's no reason for me to follow you on both platforms, right? Um, <clears throat> but yes, you can set that up. And for beginners, it's a, it just makes your life so much easier. Something can carry over, like you're, you're tagging people or whatever in the post. It doesn't That's tag right. over into Facebook, and then it look, looks like it's weird in the middle of the sentences or whatever. Exactly. For me, I just take the extra like 90 seconds to copy and paste and move it over, and then I like refix my tags and stuff like that so that it's fine on both pieces. Um, so all the stuff that we're talking about today for taking lots of photos, writing clever content, editing the photos sort of the task list gets bigger and bigger. And so I want your social media to be manageable. Um, earlier I mentioned batching, so that's like getting lots of photos at one time. Maybe you take a Monday morning or something where you create content or something like that. Um, then afterwards, what I recommend is scheduling. So scheduling uh, is available on Facebook right inside the platform. So if you write your caption and then click this drop down arrow, you get the option to schedule your content. So you can have it come out Thursday at 2 p.m. That means you can sit down early in the week, schedule content for every single day and just let it go out naturally. Um, and it doesn't mean that you have to be online all the time. So it's a lot more helpful to be scheduling. Also, if as a business owner, you're trying to push yourself to put more content out, I like to schedule so I know for sure there's something going out every day, maybe in the morning and then in the afternoon, I try to do a real time post. So like, this is what's actually happening, this is what I'm doing today or this is a new project that's going out the door. And that means um, you're just getting a little bit more content but uh, you're still having that sort of natural everyday um, engagement with people. So if you're trying to increase your number of posts, it's a good strategy for that. Uh, people always ask me if they can schedule on Instagram. Right now you can schedule on Instagram using some of the bigger third-party apps like Buffer or Hootsuite. They will let you uh, do that. Um, I personally use an app called Planoly, which lets you pre-plan your Instagram feed. The thing I like about Planoly as well, if I bring it up here on my phone. Um, oh. I'm not connected to the internet. The thing I like about Planoly is if you hold your finger on the image 
you can rearrange them and so they move around. So if you're trying to create a grid or an aesthetic or you don't want like three headshots next to each other, you can kind of pre-plan and shuffle things around. Um, Planoly doesn't let you fully auto post, but what will happen is if you set the post to come out Thursday at two, at Thursday at two, your phone will go beep beep. Do you still want to post? And you can click yes, and it copies everything over for you. So it's all preloaded. Yeah. Again, this is another activity I usually do while I'm watching a movie or chilling out at home. Is I will preload all my stuff into Planoly, make sure everything looks really good, schedule it out, and then I know my week's going to be super easy. And again, when it comes to scheduling content, because I feel like the aesthetic's so much more important on Instagram, I always plan for Instagram first and then dump on Facebook whatever I've created. Um, so really quickly, I'm going to talk about some ideas for what to post. Um, so for anyone who's stuck. And to be honest, usually when I work with small business owners, that's usually the hang up is they run out of ideas for what they should be posting. Now, we've already kind of talked about a number of exercises. So establishing your brand, like doing that exercise where you, you write down all the things you want people to say um, and breaking out your process. So there's lots of posts there. Um, you can pull some more posts out by sit down and doing a brainstorm about your product or your service. So again, break out all the features of it, um, why, where it's made, what this widget does, what comes included in the box. All of those things are social media posts and you can really get people interested in your product or service. Again, there's your process. These are sort of the four P's that we give people if they get stuck. So the first one is to talk about your product. The second is to talk about your process, which is that exercise that we talked about of breaking it up all the steps. The third is people. Again, that reminder that we always wanna see human faces and eyes on our feeds. Um, and if you have lots of people in your office, it just makes your job so much easier. You could go around the office and take each person's photo and do a little paragraph about how many pets they have, you know, or how into their cat they are, or right before Mother's Day, have everybody share um, a memory of their mom, something like that. So it becomes very easy for you to pull content if you're working with the other people in your office. Um, so having people on your feed is the competitive edge for small business. Uh, big companies like Target, Walmart, they don't perform very well on social media because there isn't a human story. There isn't a face for people to fall in love with. And so if that is your competitive edge, make sure you're using that. Make sure you're telling a story and getting people excited about your business and your journey. I know I feel that way when I see other businesses post and I we did their branding three years ago and now they're out being hugely successful. Like I feel so loyal to them and invested in their story and your clients will feel that way about you as well if you engage them and sort of bring them in. Um, the fourth P here is something pretty or purposeful. And in another workshop I teach, I talk about how uh, beauty has kind of become a business metric. It's something that we should measure and make an investment in. So there's never been a better time to be in business if you're creative or if you like um, art or doing beautiful things or photography. Um, pretty photos get click-throughs. They get more likes, they get more engagement. And by pretty, I mean clean, in focus, well lit, um, having an aesthetic to it. All of that helps increase the um, amount of sales and click-through rates that you're getting on your content. So. Um, this is an example account, again, of someone I follow, um, Ava Berry Lane. She makes these little wooden rounds that have these letters cut out of them. Uh, her Instagram account is so good because she's following these four Ps. You can see there's pictures of her, her product. There she is in her process actually like cutting wood. And then she shares some beautiful things like her rabbit and stuff uh, that's on her feed. So her, she's so successful and has so many followers that she actually couldn't keep up with demand for her product anymore. So these little rounds that she makes, now she makes them and then on Sundays she runs an auction. So she puts up each of the ones that are available and people bid for them in the comments. It was the only way that she could keep up with the demand. 
So really putting an effort into your uh, social media, into your Instagram account, you will get a return from that time investment. Any questions or anything like that? Um, some final thoughts and tips. Again, we've kind of touched on this repeatedly through the workshop is to batch your work to save time. So again, take a lot of photos at once. Um, I recommend if you're making a product or if you box and ship something, anything like that, you spend a day doing your task, but taking three times longer because you're breaking up every step to take content. So even yourself, maybe you want to give away like a free haircut or something, but it's going to take a long time because you're going to have somebody there who's grabbing content from every step. And then you can schedule that out for weeks at a time. Um, another uh, idea to keep in mind is that you can reuse your content. Just because you've shared a photo one time doesn't mean you can never share it again. Usually there's a three to four month period where your followers come on and you have some steady people and then they start to drop off and new ones come on. So you can recycle co uh, content um, and that would be, did I talk about evergreen content when I showed you guys the branded images that didn't have dates on them? That's a classic example of stuff that you could reuse again. Um, if you're writing blogs, uh, you don't want to be starting fresh all the time. You can write a series of 10 to 15 blogs, run them for three to four months, and then change the title, change the feature image, and run them again. So that way you're getting more out of the investment that you're making. Similarly, if you get um, a photo shoot done, I see lots of people who make the investment in the photo shoot and then they only use the photo one time. There's so many pictures that you can even flip, you know, where you have that option to horizontally flip a photo. So if you're standing like this and then you flip it and then the person's standing over here. So you can use all of your pictures, then flip some of them, make them black and white, crop sections of them, zoom in to different sections of the photos so that you get to use those same images over and over. Also, McDonald's has been showing us the same picture of the same hamburger for 15 years and it's still working. <laughs> yeah, it is probably the same hamburger. Yeah, uh, and it's still working. So don't put that pressure on yourself that you have to be creating from scratch, brand new every day. You can systemize a little bit some of what you're doing. Um, don't outsource your social media completely. And I know that sounds really weird coming from a person who runs a social media company, but I do see it all the time that people come to us, they say, please post to my social media, and then they never touch it. I can't build that emotional equity for you. It's easier if you have a photo shoot and I have lots of content of you, I can get pretty far, but you will lose touch with your audience and your audience loses touch with you. So what I usually recommend to our, part, uh, our clients and how we kind of work with people moving forward is we like to give them photo shoots or we'll do social media suites where we create collections of graphics that we give them that they can post on their own time in their own words. And that kind of makes it easier for you to have a library of pre-made stuff. The other thing I would outsource is engagement um, because that makes such a big difference in your outcomes online and it's a time consuming task for you to do. So if there was something that I was gonna outsource, it would be engagement and graphic design. And then you still sort of oversee and manage the creation of your account. Um, and again, the tail wagging the dog, social media impacting the way that we run businesses. Um, involve your team and create systems at work for creating content. If Anyone here, if you're a brokerage, a team, anything like that, you should have a meeting about what kind of content do we create. We're gonna have a day, everyone participates. Um, in a lot of places that we've worked, uh, spas in particular, will develop a group chat. And so people put content in the group chat and then one person is responsible for taking that content and creating the captions and putting it out there. So that gives you an element of sort of quality control, but you're really using everybody there to kind of help you uh, gather materials. Um, a final quick thought on social media is to not just dump it on the youngest person in your office. Uh, just because people know how to use Facebook or Instagram 
uh, technically doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to grow your business with it, right? And so even a lot of the things that we've talked about today here of the activities that you could do and the kind of posts that you should be putting out, um, that's going to take you so much farther than if you just gave it to a 19 year old who knows how to do boomerangs. So it's a really good idea for you guys to educate yourselves, educate your team, make rules and guidelines, and then oversee what's happening on your social. Are there any questions at all? Or did anybody come today like hoping to get an answer on something specific that they didn't hear me talk about? Oh, thank you. And I will say that even though I did the Instagram one, mm -hmm. I, there was nothing in there that I felt like I should already this last time, so I posted mine first. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, did you take the Instagram one too? Oh, wow, okay. Like Sorry, I, I didn't yeah, recognize like you. Really encompassed everything and filled in the gaps on that stuff, but didn't, this wasn't repetitive. It was just more like, hey, this is really important. Make sure you're reminding you to do the things that you should be doing. Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, so good exercise for everybody moving forward. Maybe in the next week or two, try to see if you can get to 50 posts a week. And for a lot of you, that might mean that for two weeks you stockpile a little bit to get going. Um, but try to get to 50 posts a week and see if you can do it and see the response that you get in terms of engagement, how much reach the algorithms are giving you, and if it makes any kind of impact on your leads or anything like that. Do you think so. there's a saturation point where that becomes too much for people though? It can Depending if you, doing, yeah. it depends what you're posting. Uh, for a hair salon, probably no problem for you. If you're a mortgage broker, very challenging, right? Because the content's already so dry. And that's where it becomes really useful to have story arcs and mm -hmm. talking about things outside your business and sort of creating a lifestyle that you mm -hmm. celebrate. You have to have additional things to post about other than mortgage rates, right? Sure. So. Or pictures and videos of the same people every time. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, in terms of the saturation point also, the algorithms protect you a little bit in that not every single person who is following you sees every single post, which is really important to keep in mind, which is why I think they're asking you to post so many times is because it is hitting different areas of your market or of your followers. Um, also, the algorithms watch how often people are engaging. So if people aren't looking at your content, if they're not liking, if they're not commenting, the algorithms will show them less and less of your material. So that's good in a way because if they're bored of you, they're not gonna see it and you're not gonna annoy them. But it's also a bad thing that every t once in a while you really wanna get something out there like questions or some kind of engagement or a contest to make sure that your content goes right back out into their feeds. And technically those are the people you want more of because the ones who are engaged with you all the time you already got those. So you want yeah. people who aren't engaged. Those are your all-star fans, right? Yeah. So you always want to take care of them and baby them yeah. a little bit, give them yeah. some free stuff every now and again. But yes, you do want to always be working on that sort of outer shell of sort of people who have not fully committed yet. For About sure. Same with the stories and yeah. algorithm. Yeah. Like which ones go by people's feeds there? Um, the stories, again, kind of goes by what people are watching, what they like. If they use hashtag cats and I love cats, the algorithms are more likely to show me that story. Also, if I engage with their content more, they're going to preload those stories ahead so that you see that material first. So, so it only shows you five or six at the top of your screen each time. But it that's right. Flow through, obviously, but yeah. you know how many people like keep scooping down. They'll or? prioritize it according to what they think you're going to spend the most time on because the algorithms job is to keep you on that social media platform as long as possible right so they're kids, that's for sure. yeah they're not going to show you anything that you're going to click off of if they can help it because they want you to be there yeah okay. awesome did you feel like you got enough content because i know that you're a writer and so sometimes it's hard to showcase a service like that where there isn't a visual thing for people to look at yeah. right no, this was great this is the good refresher like it Okay, so there's like content you feel like and pictures you can take because I think pictures would be something that would be more difficult for you, right? Yeah, for yeah, because I use social media in two ways. Like sometimes I use it, my clients, my clients want me to create content for their social media mm -hmm. for Drive Drive, and then there's the separate project of promoting my own business. So as yeah. I've been sitting here, I'm kind of thinking both things and yeah, I've been out of the game for a little bit. So this was nice to be like, okay, now I know what I'm. Awesome. The writing thing is interesting because one thing for me is I actually think better as a writer than visually. So mm -hmm. the trend, and so like when Twitter came along, I was like, great, I can say whatever I want. People are going to like listen. Or blogging, <laughs> and blogging was kind of the same thing. 
Yeah. Right. But then realizing, like, yeah, like you said, it takes a long time to write an article or a blog for something. You got to research it and you got to say things that you hope people are going to be interested in. Yeah. But people just don't read anymore. So now it's like I still mm-hmm. want to say something useful that, and then come up with the image that still tells that story. story exactly. It just yeah. changes yeah. my way of trying to promote that yeah. too. So I'm sure yeah. that's similar. That's where those stocky images really come in handy, where it's like flat lays of your desk or things like that, where it's a photo that you could write anything with it. You know what I mean? If you're a person who thinks of the caption first, then you need to have a good library of just like stock images. Um, And that's an argument, again, tail wagging the dog, where it might be a worthwhile investment for you to have a really nice office where like, or like couches and blankets where you snuggle up and you're doing your writing because those are the kind of pictures that people are going to want to engage with. Yeah, a lot of, for me, for, on that side of it, a lot of my clients are probably not, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> mm-hmm. if, you, if a lot of your clients are commercial, then I would take a more business yeah, approach to that, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's where it's been so far, but it depends what mm-hmm. I might want to change that in the future, so. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And are you ladies thinking of getting into Instagram for your business? The engagement rates on Instagram are so much higher than Facebook right now, like so much higher. If we were to do a contest and give away a $25 gift card, you'll almost get double the entries on Instagram that you do on Facebook. I feel so, like Facebook business is skiing, especially because the internet has a struggle for privacy and everything now. Yeah. I Even though Instagram is part of Facebook. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but when I do boost a post, like if, if I boost a post on Facebook for you know open house or whatever this week, mm-hmm. um, the number of likes that I get on Instagram is double what, if not more. Absolutely. So it's predominantly from engagement. I'm sorry. Yeah. That kind of tend to message out saying like, hey, maybe Facebook is kind of becoming a mm-hmm. uh, not so popular. Yeah. It's probably like established itself and reached its peak and like plateauing in terms of, of use and reach and engagement and all of that. No. We're seeing um, in our ads department, in our lead generation, like the rules are becoming so strict for what you can do in terms of ads. Like can't ask questions, can't make health claims, can't, 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 can't. So they're constantly sort of rejecting ad concepts. So we're having to retry, retry. So it's getting a lot more bureaucratic in there for sure. What are your thoughts on, I've been using a little bit a a (coughs) video, sort of stock video uh, platform called, you probably know it, it's called called Promo. Mm -hmm. They have little mini clips that I like that are like 6 to 12 seconds. They have like long ones too, but I'm knowing that people don't have much attention span. Yeah. But usually try to grab something that's sort of maybe a bit quirky or unique that isn't, I don't like using actual like other people's fitness stuff, so I'd rather just show video of our own people doing that, but but it might be something like, um, one of them that I did recently was a guy sort of slobby looking guy eating pizza on a bike like and then mm-hmm. relating back to that does that do you think people engage with that stuff or yep you can use that i don't want to do too much of it but yep that's what i would say is a measured approach because every time you do that <coughs> you're potentially giving away the credit for that post to somebody else right? right so if it's the guy in the bike eating pizza maybe that doesn't matter but if the post is about a fitness instructor you whenever possible want to be that person yeah, no, I actually yeah. have never wanted to use the ones that show other people doing box jumps or whatever like i want to show our people doing that stuff yeah absolutely like one of them was a couple of business guys outside a building and one ran over and kicked the other one in the butt. It was made for something completely different, but I thought, oh, this is like, I was yep. to use this to get people off their butts, basically. And yep, then that's to works. a message to something that was a little bit different. Yeah, for sure. But I also don't want to feel like, oh, I don't want to put seem too much like it's corporate or that it feels like an ad because then maybe that's going to turn people off of the relationship part. Mm-hmm. As long as it's sporadic and not like too intense, right. then you should be fine. Yeah. Also, a really quick note on that about how you think sometimes that you don't want to share things that might turn certain people off or or whatever Um, and real estate agents are a really great example of this is the way that you post in your natural personality there's people who want to work with someone just like that so as a realtor if you're a really aggressive like hard negotiator be that like you can swear and be assertive in your social media because there's people who want that from their realtor Then there's other people who want to see 15 houses and don't want to be yelled at and they want someone who's more passive and kind and softer. And so you actually, by being yourself and posting your natural personality, you're going to attract the clients who most want to work with a person like that. So it's like the best way to to find and do business, really. You want to weed out the people that you're not going to work well with anyway. That's right. Yeah. 
And if you're creating a fake persona, you're gonna attract clients who like like the fake persona and then you're gonna have all this tension in your business and why do I keep getting clients like this? So it's best to just be yourself, 100%. Which sounds like a cat poster, motivational cat poster. <laughs> be yourself, but it actually works better, best in this application. Cool. Awesome. Thank you very much for coming and for tolerating all of the cameras. <laughs> when you launch the reality.